Sal Berry. We're going to start talking about cards you should invest in. You should definitely invest in Connor McDavid. And Tim Parrish. Here's a lesson, kids. If you're going to steal, don't steal serial number cards. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Barry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today we are going to talk about the Ryan O'Reilly trade. So in two podcasts, we're talking about two big trades. Last week, we talked about Vladimir Tarasenko being traded. This week, we're talking about Ryan O'Reilly being traded. We're also going to talk a little bit about the stadium series that just happened. We'll talk about the cancellation of the Mighty Ducks Game Changers TV series, and we'll talk about some new and upcoming hockey card releases and hockey card news. So we got a full deck ahead of us. Tim, what's going on, man? You tell me. Toronto made a pretty big trade. I'm a little annoyed by it only because I started player collecting Ryan O'Reilly this year. And now I'm like, oh, damn it, now he's at the Maple Leafs. Now i got to compete with all those crazy Maple Leaf fans for Ryan O'Reilly cards that I was picking up pretty cheap. I think in the past, I don't know, start of the season, so four or five months, I've amassed a nice little collection of autographed and, like, game-used cards with, like, autographs. You know, depending on the card, I mean, you can get an autograph of his cheap as, like, 8 or $10 because, I mean, he signs a lot of stuff. Now it was like I was looking at like a cup rookie and I was like, "Eh, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? Maybe I'll send an offer on this. I don't know. And now he's like, he's with the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I'm just like, all right, forget it. (laughs) So that's what's on my mind. I mean, I wasn't surprised that O'Reilly was traded. No, everybody knew it was going to happen. Well, I mean, he's on an expiring contract and he's underperforming and... I mean, what do you do? You got a guy who's underperforming. He's on an expired contract or expiring contract. And there's a lot of teams who are interested in him. So, yeah, you're going to make that move. But it's it's always a little jarring when a team captain gets traded. When, I don't remember that happening as often in the old days. But since we have salary caps and, you know, all that kind of stuff and free agency and everything now is what it is, it happens way more often, it seems like. A lot of the times with before the salary cap, it would just be like, well, we'll hang on to the player because it doesn't matter as much. Like if we add another good player, we don't have to get rid of a good player to make cap space, as they call it, space in the salary cap. So what's funny about this trade, just to give a, a quick rundown of it. So Toronto gets Ryan O'Reilly and Noel Achari. St. Louis gets a 2023 first round pick a 2023 third round pick previously held by Ottawa, a 2024 second round pick, uh, Mikhail Abramoff, Adam Gaudet, and the Blues also keep 50% of O'Reilly's salary. So 3.75 million is what they keep. But then Minnesota is also involved in this because it was a three-way trade sort of thing. And so Minnesota gets a 2024 fourth round pick and uh, they do that for taking on 25% of O'Reilly's salary. So they take on 1.875 million of cap space and they get a fourth rounder in next year's draft. Which is garbage. That's pointless. Take 25% of his salary on and you get what? A guy that's probably never going to play in the NHL. (laughs) That's kind of dumb. They always do these kind of creative financing things because something like that, seven and a half million, no one's willing to take that on. And you know they want to dump him and they they got to get rid of him. They don't want to keep it and they don't want to get rid of him for nothing. So you got to find a trade partner and all too often do you have to find somebody to fork the bill and be the banker when it comes to this kind of stuff and eat some of the salary. And how many times have we seen over the years that it's usually the Coyotes? I mean, here you have Minnesota retaining 25% of a player's salary that they're never going to see the services of, nor are they probably going to get any services from the guy that they end up picking in the draft at that position. But yeah, you never know. I do know this. It seems to me like that is kind of a waste just to step in and, and be the banker when it comes to this kind of deal. But, you know, did the blues get anything back for it? Yeah. I mean, somewhat. 
I don't know if the prospect. I don't know anything about him. Mikhail Abramov, I don't no. I have no idea. As far as Adam Gaudet, he's been around the league. He's bounced around from a few teams. Is he an NHLer? Sure. Does he replace O'Reilly? No. No. I mean, he's a bottom line guy. Can they turn something around with those picks? You know, considering the Leafs have a first round pick this year and they get the Senators pick, which is a third round pick that Toronto got from Ottawa. So they get that too, plus a second round pick next year in the 2024 draft. So, you know, you got a few picks in there that they're able to build off of, which is good. I mean, especially building towards the future when obviously they've cashed it in for this year and they already know that this is a lost cause. So, but I mean, essentially you look at the blues now, probably their two biggest players gone now. <laughs> well, you know, they always say, are they going to be buyers or sellers? I mean, once they shipped off Tarasenko a week or so ago, obviously they're sellers and they're still obviously sellers. Um, I like this trade for St. Louis because they get a first round pick for a guy that they had no intention of re-signing, most likely. I mean, unless it was like at a very low salary or much lower than the $7.5 million a year. So they get a first round and they get a third round this year. Okay, third round's okay. And they get a second round next year, and I think second round is good. So, I mean, I think for just looking at the picks that they got, I think it's a nice trade for them. Now, as far as Toronto, they are just stacked down the middle. I mean, they arguably have the best number three center in the league now with Ryan O'Reilly because, I mean, you got, what, Austin Matthews, you got John Tavares, and now you got Ryan O'Reilly as the number three center. So, I mean, that's going to lessen his responsibility, probably cut his ice time a little bit. Instead of him doing, you know, 20 minutes a night, maybe it's going to be 15 minutes a night. So he'll be a little more rested, but he's still going to be put into important situations and stuff. I think this really makes Toronto a heck of a lot stronger. Every year the Maple Leaf fans say this is the year or this is going to be the year. And, you know, I looked at their roster today and it it looks pretty good end to end. You know, are there things that I think should be better? I mean, yeah, I think their goaltending has always been a question mark. And I think of like Toronto and Edmonton and the two things that I always ask is, why can't they get better goaltending? Why can't they get better defensemen? Like they have good defensemen, but... Who do you think would help Toronto more, having Ryan O'Reilly or Eric Carlson? I say it to my kids all the time, defense wins championships. Right. They don't believe me, but it happens time and time again. I mean, you look at championship teams, they all have a really great defenseman on their roster. I mean, I'm trying to think of an exception, but like whenever I think of Stanley Cup championship teams, you know, oh, from the past 30 years or the past 10 years, All the teams have had like one or more stud defensemen. Looking at Toronto, again, I'm not going to critique like all of their defensemen, but, you know, I look and I go, yeah, they got a pretty solid decor, but I'm just thinking like, does anybody stand out as like the man? They're always going to need help on the back end. They haven't built themselves that way. And any of their prospects that they've tried to bring up for defensemen or in the net and everything else, they haven't worked out. So they're always going to need help on the back end until they fix it. And really what it boils down to every year is they're out searching for that star goalie that's going to push them over the end. Those aren't available. Those guys don't become available. Very rarely do you ever see a superstar goalie get moved, especially at the trade deadline. I mean, it happens occasionally, but most of the time those guys are – Older, they're pushing to the waning side of their careers. Right. Not to take anything away from them. I mean, heck, you know, everybody thought Mark andre Fleury was washed up and then he's, you know, Vezina material. Right. So it's like, yeah, they have that potential, but there's still, there's not a whole lot of those guys available at the time. And Toronto has never been able to be a player when it comes to that. But I mean, to your other point of of having a solid down the middle, don't sleep on that Achari part of that deal either because, you know, you got a middle to bottom six forward here that also can score. And he's already shown that 
know, he's a two-way guy. So penalty kill, on penalty kill, he's he's a great guy to have out there because he's a great two-way forward. So I think that's another good pickup. So, you know, everybody looks at O'Reilly, but I think that was sneaky to get that extra. Right. So I don't know. I mean, are the Leafs better off on paper? Yeah. They sure didn't show it against the Blackhawks the other night, but, you know, we'll see. Tell you what, if they get to the playoffs, which all signs point to they will, if they don't make it out of the first round, ooh, there's going to be like, it'll be like Vancouver when they win or lose. Or lose, yes. Win, lose, or riot. Yeah. Or we should say win, It's win, win lose, lose, and riot. And riot. Yeah, yes. I was about to say that. Win, lose, and riot, right? All right, so uh, the stadium series was Saturday. Tim, what'd you think? I know you were glued to your television that day. Honestly, I forgot it was even on. Wow. And then it it took me forever to to find it. And then once I found it, it was already like in the second period. And I'm like, you know, I didn't really see any advertising and they weren't pushing it. Like, you know, when the Winter Classic was on, it was on, it was advertised on like every channel. And I saw commercials for it on all, all over everything. And I was ready for it. You know, I knew when it was. Of course, it's the same time every year, but still, I knew when it was. I knew when I was going to be on. I knew what was going on. And I listened to a lot of, you know, radio shows and stuff like that. And yeah, did they talk about it? But it was never anything like, eh. They never made a big deal out of it. Now, part of that maybe because Ovechkin didn't play in it since his dad passed away. So he went back to Russia. Maybe that's part of it. But still. You would think these outdoor games, that they're hyping up so much that they would want to get it out in front of people. Put it in your face. Hey, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Especially if it's something that's going to be on ESPN. But I feel like they fell short of that. And then by the time I turned the game on, I'm just like, eh. So, unfortunately, I was not sucked in. So, Saturday I did the Ludex card show. And that went well. And that was a lot of fun. And it attracted more hockey people because there were two hockey autograph signers there, Steve Larmer and Andrew Shaw. And then I was able to pack up, get home, chill for a few minutes, go grab something to eat, bring it back and watch the stadium series because it was was on at seven. I knew this game was going to happen. I had it in in the back of my mind, like, whatever, you know, I want to make sure I'm plopped in front of my TV at seven because I like outdoor games. I do as well. Well, yeah, but I mean... I like them from the comfort of my couch. Now, all day or earlier in that day, Puck Junk contributor Jim Howard was sending me pictures because Jim is a Carolina Hurricane season ticket holder. So he had tickets to this game. And he like even was like really excited that he got to park close to the entrance. Like he sent me a picture like, look at how close I got to park to the entrance. Right. And then he sent me a picture from his seats. And I said, gee, I hope you brought binoculars. My other answer was going to be, what is that, a rink for ants? Because it was like he's at a football stadium and he's far away from the rink. So it's like I like the outdoor games because the camera's close and sometimes they do those overhead cameras, which feel very video game like. You know what I'm talking about? They're a little disorienting when they they go up and over and they're kind of doing that flyover stuff. But I like watching it on my TV. I don't think I'd enjoy it being there because I'd be like super far away. But I was really disappointed that there was no pregame coverage, at least not on ESPN, not on ABC. I mean, I watched Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. And then it was the stadium series. NHL Network did some pregame stuff. They also did NHL Radio did some pregame stuff. If you don't mind just listening and not watching anything. Plus, there was all kinds of stuff you could find online and on social media. I went back and looked and saw, like, the arrival of the teams and all that. Washington arrived in, like, yellow school buses and came out looking like they were the varsity football team. Mm-hmm. And then the Hurricanes dressed up like it was, well, everybody looked like Paint Stewart, if you ask me. If you remember Paint Stewart, the golfer that used to wear, like, the knickers with his okay. pants pulled up and his socks pulled way up. and the, Okay. You know, the the hat and the whole deal. Um, they all came out looking like that. That was kind of cool. Like I said, I had to watch it later because it was already done and over with. 
I know that the NHL Network had coverage. The thing is, is that I recently changed cable subscription services. I moved away from Comcast Xfinity, and I had their sports and more package. And then I moved over to DirecTV. And I don't have NHL Network with that. And I can upgrade for that, and I might. But I kind of wanted to just see what I had and didn't have before I decided if I was going to upgrade or not, instead of just saying, oh, I'm going to buy everything right off the get-go. Like, first, I just want to see, what do I have? What do I feel that's lacking? Well, I really like the NHL network, so I'm probably going to end up getting that. But I feel like part of the hype is if you're going to have this outdoor game, there needs to be some sort of pregame on, like, the main channel that it's on. Right. Instead of like, okay, it's seven o'clock and now seven oh five and here we go, or seven ten after all the ceremonial, the stat and the other thing. So I think it's almost like watching a game on center ice package where you turn it on, you're like, uh, the game's supposed to be starting. What's happening? Where's the game? Mm -hmm. Where's the game? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it flips on as the ref's dropping the puck. Yep. It's like, what is the what is the deal with this? At least with like ESPN plus with watching the games on there. They'll actually show pregame and some postgame. Not always. Which I like it. Sometimes, yes, but not always. Because there have been times where it's like 6.58 and it'll say, this program hasn't started yet. And I'm like, come on, it's a 7 o'clock game, you know. I think it depends on the team and what their deal is with their providers. Yes. Because I know with the with the Penguins, if it's a home game and you go to the Penguins feed, because I watch most of those on there, they usually have pregame. So you get to see like the pregame interviews and the little specials and stuff that they do. And I think I've seen both of the New York teams as well as the New Jersey feed. Mm-hmm. All of them, all of them do that too. Must just depend on what the broadcast provider allows. Colorado also does pregame because yeah. for a while I was watching them pretty regularly and I liked them because they'd have their pregame. And I, I felt like I got to know the team better. And I believe Seattle also does pre and post game, which they would because they're trying to, well, Seattle and Vegas kind of have this different vision because they are the newest teams, but they're kind of like, well, hey, our fans can be anywhere, right? Like our fans don't have to be just confined to our city or our state or our region. Like, Vegas and Seattle, they want to have fans from all over. I mean, at least that's how I see how they've been kind of marketing and promoting their team. Like the whole regional thing doesn't mean much anymore because we have satellite TV and and we can watch any game anywhere. You know what I mean? Like, so I like it when teams are like, hey, you know what? We have fans in other states. Let's have the pre and post game shows available. Yeah, and it's much, like you said, you like to get to know the team, and it definitely makes a difference and makes it more of a personal level for fandom. You know, being able to watch those shows and, like, the the little side shows that they do in the local markets and the Mm -hmm. fact that, like, NHL Network will broadcast those sometimes when there's nothing else going on. I always watch those. Even for teams I don't like, I watch them because you get, like, an inside look that you wouldn't normally get. Especially like when they talk to like players a little more in depth, players that you wouldn't normally like know much about and when you get to know more about them. Just I, I, lo- I love that sort of stuff. I record all the in the rooms, the penguins in the room. Oh, yeah. I record all those, but I don't do the other ones. But if I catch them on, I'll watch them. So, uh, you know, I was watching the, the stadium series and the Carolina Hurricanes looked like they were cruising to a shutout. I'm like, oh, this would be so cool if they got a shutout. And then what did you know? Tom Wilson ruins everything. And when he scored that goal, I was just like, Tom Wilson, Tom Wilson ruins everything. If he's not giving an opponent a concussion with an egregious hit, he's spoiling an otherwise perfect game for the other team. But, you know, good on Tom Wilson. It was his first game back since, I think, January. So, Yay, he scored a goal and spoiled the otherwise wonderful shutout bid by the Hurricanes. It's only like his third goal of the season because he's been out hurt for quite a while. What does that give him, like three points in three outdoor games now? Something like that. Maybe two points in three outdoor games? Jeez, it's like the Capitals are in an outdoor game every year. So, you know, he's, he's had a lot of practice at it. So let's talk about the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the Team USA women's Olympic hockey team winning the gold medal 
at the Nagano Olympics in 1998. I remember that Olympics. I remember what a big deal it was. You had the NHL players playing for the first time for the men's Olympic ice hockey. And then you had women's Olympic ice hockey as a medal sport for the first time ever. So it was a first for both. It was the first women's Olympic medal ice hockey tournament. It was the first time that the NHL like closed down shop. I mean, you had NHL players in the Olympics before, you know, whether they were on their way down or they were on their way up or whatever. I mean, I remember Mike Richter playing in the 1988 Olympics for Team USA, and this was before he played for the Rangers. I mean, Mike Richter was on that team. Brian Leach was on that team, and then they went to the Rangers, right? Likewise, Andy Moog was on the Canadian Olympic team in 88 because he was in a contract dispute. So you did have NHLers in the Olympics before, but this was really when the men's team, it was like the best on best, like the truly the best on best. But you know what? That tournament, if you were a North American hockey fan, the men's tournament did not go as we would have liked to have seen. I know United States, the less said about that, the better. Canadians, I don't know how they feel about that. I don't remember how Canada finished, but it wasn't gold or silver. Now, in the women's, on the other hand, that was awesome. The two teams that should have medaled, that should have been the top two teams, were the top two teams. But what was maybe a little surprising was that the United States won. Yeah, you know, up to this point, like you said, there wasn't you know, this was new. Women's ice hockey as a medal type sport was new for the Olympics that year. Team USA and Team Canada had already, you know, started to play against each other and a rivalry had already started forming because I think they played in four world championships world prior championships, to that. Yeah. You know, in the gold medal games against each other. Um, they were in like the Nations Cup finals before. So it had already started to percolate a little bit. And you know, the fact that uh, Team USA had won the 97 Three Nations Cup that they had in Lake Placid, they beat them 3 nothing in the gold medal game and they got their first international title. You know, bringing that into, you know, the Olympics, if you remember, they went in there, they stomped on China, they stomped on Sweden, they beat Finland pretty well, destroyed Japan like 10 nothing. They were dominant over everybody in the round robin play and so then they get in there and these matchups have ever since have been huge there's no love loss between team usa and team canada yeah are some of the players friends and do they play on the, the each other's teams in the various women's leagues absolutely but when it comes to playing for your country it's a whole different story and it takes on this deep-seated hatred. <laughs> and I've heard the ladies talk about the these events in the past. Um, and it's just, you know, to hear them talk about it, it gets you kind of pumped up. Because that rivalry, you know, that still exists today, there's nothing like it. There really isn't. Because now you watch when we have the NHL players go to the Olympics you see a little better balance across teams, I guess. Are U.S. and Canada still dominant? Kind of. But are there other teams that can compete? Because they do have a lot more NHL players on their roster, yeah. But when it comes down to the women, I mean, it's like U.S., Canada, and everyone else. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's really everyone else. It's like a it's a battle for that bronze medal. But, I mean, every now and then you'll have, like, Finland or I think Sweden. I think those two have also sometimes challenged for silver, even. Um, and that's not to take anything away from the competition, because I'm not trying to do that. I'm not saying that if it's, you know, Sweden versus China in, in a match that you shouldn't watch, because it's still good hockey. It's just the intensity level of U.S.-Canada is just out of this world. It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. And that's pushed forward through time all the way up till now where February 20th, which that's tonight that we're recording this, is another game in the rivalry series. So U.S. and Canada, which U.S. is leading 3-2 to in the series over Canada. 
for this year's rivalry series. So, yeah, I mean, it's it pretty much set the tone for everything that came after it. I mean, that was the point in time where you could like draw the line of women's hockey prior to that versus what women's hockey has become since then. That's the line right there. I mean, it's only gotten better, obviously. Absolutely. And the other teams, the other nations have gotten better too. And, you know, it, it's funny because, like, you'll watch the United States play Sweden, and, I mean, it's either going to be a close game or the U.S. is going to just win by, like, a, a boatload of goals. But if you watch, like, Sweden and Finland play, it's going to be a very close 3-2, to 2-1 two, two to kind of game. Or if you even if you watch, like, say, Russia, because the Russian women's team is nowhere as – in the rankings, like if you if you look at like the men's, it's always USA, Canada, Russia. Like any one of those three can win a gold medal that year. Those three are pretty interchangeable. Maybe one team will underperform and fall fourth or fifth or sixth, right? But those three are always contenders for gold. In the women's, the Russian team is nowhere near as good. So when you see like Russia play Japan or China or something like that, it'll be a 2-1 game. It'll be a good game. It'll be an intense game. And that's why when you said, if you watch the other games, you'll be entertained. You're absolutely right about that. It's almost like if USA and Canada play any other team, it's most likely going to be a blowout. And it's going to be like, yeah, this team wins. They're great. But it's not exciting. But then if you watch one of those teams that gets stomped on by the U.S. or Canadian women's teams play against another similar team, It's exciting. It's close and it's exciting. So that's where the excitement comes in is that, like I said, who's going to challenge for the bronze medal and maybe even surprise and get a silver medal? Yeah. And if you haven't seen these or maybe you weren't alive at the time because there are some listeners that weren't, go back and check them out. You can find these games online. You can find a lot of this, even if you're just watching the highlights and everything. It's still. It's still fun, and it brings your patriotic blood to a boil. Let's put it that way. You can also find the um, USA-Canada women's gold medal game. You can also find that on a VHS tape in my basement somewhere because I recorded the game. There you go. Yeah, it's somewhere. Go to Sal's house and dig through his basement, and you can find a VHS. You'll also have to dig and find the VCR because you probably don't have one. I have one. I have two. You're the only one I know that has one, then. Probably the only one who has two, then. Well, if you're the only one with one, you're definitely the only one with two. Well, one of them is a VCR DVD combo player that I believe it does dubbing from VHS to DVD. My mom gave it to me. I never bothered to test it out. Fancy. And then the other one is hooked to my computer so I can digitize footage. And I think I've done that probably four times in my life. So (laughs) money well spent. Well, no, these were just VCRs that I had, but like, you know, I say, Oh, I'm going to just start digitizing all these games. And the only game I ever digitized, actually, I've only digitized two things in its entirety, the 1997 NHL awards, which I put up on YouTube. You can find that on the puff junk YouTube channel. And the, 1989 celebrity all-star hockey game that was at Chicago Stadium. And I digitized that because one of the guys in that game asked me for a copy. And I said, all right, I will do this. And it was a lot of work. You can't just digitize it and walk away because something bad will always happen if you walk away and come back three hours later. So it's like you have to watch the thing that you're digitizing as it's digitizing. So you have to really want to rewatch a game from 30 years ago, you know, and it's kind of hard to do. And it's like Chicago and Hartford play to a 3-3 tie. It's just like, ooh, great. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I want to spend my Saturday afternoon rewatching a tie from 30 years ago. And it was a celebrity game? Yeah, there used to be this thing called the Celebrity All-Star Tour. Usually, like, the home team would be, like, the Blackhawks legends or the Red Wings legends. And then the other team would be ex-NHLers and celebrities. So, like, the one that I have on VHS has Jerry Hauser, who played Killer Carlson in Slapshot, and Matthew Perry, 
and Jason Priestley. I mean, they were both very, you know, they were young. This is before their, their careers really took off because this was like 89. But then they're also augmented by some ex-NHLers. And then also like Micah Ruzioni was like one of the celebrity all-stars. And Jim Craig was a net for them. If they weren't playing in Detroit, then you might have a few Red Wings on the celebrity all-star team. But then if they were playing in Detroit, the Red Wings would play on the Detroit team. And then like some of the Blackhawks would play on the celebrity all-star team, like Keith Magnuson or Cliff Coral or whomever. So the guy who trained the Mighty Ducks kids, which we're going to talk about the Mighty Ducks next, but the Mighty Ducks movies had a hockey trainer named Jack White. Jack White was originally an animation supervisor. He did like the Pink Panther cartoons in the 80s. And he also did like a lot of hockey commercials when they need like a hockey advisor. He was like their hockey advisor. So he was hired by Disney. They said, hey, would you train these kids how to play hockey for this movie we're making called The Mighty Ducks? So that's how I got to know him when he mentioned to me the Celebrity All-Star Game. I'm like, wait a minute. I have that on tape. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, you got to make me a copy. I'm like, well, you're talking to me about your memories of working on the Mighty Ducks movies. So it's the least I can do. So he was very excited to get a copy of that. So I wish I had the Celebrity All-Star Game from a couple of years ago when Justin Bieber got the snot beat out of him by Pronger. Oh, that was great. Yes, the Celebrity All-Star Game that nobody saw because it was streamed on the NHL network. I still have very bitter feelings about that. Not just streamed, but streamed with no sound. Except for the mics that picked up what was going on in the ice. In other news, um, David Krejci played his 1,000th game. And Connor McDavid eclipsed the 100-point mark. So if you're thinking about investing in some hockey cards, you should probably invest in Connor McDavid. You think Call so? Me. I think that's good investment advice. You, you've heard it from us here. We're, we're going to start talking about cards you should invest in. You should definitely invest in Connor McDavid cards. I feel like he's a long shot, though. No, 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 no. Don't don't sleep on Connor McDavid. He's he's the real deal. This time next year, we're going to be like the only two cards worth collecting are both named Connor. Yeah. How about it? Connor McDavid and Connor McMichael of the Washington Capitals. That's exactly who I meant. <laughs> Connor Bedard that you meant, of course. Which is interesting because the night that McDavid hit his 100 points, so did Connor Bedard. Wow. Which is kind of ironic, I think. Uh, it's not ironic. It's coincidental. I think it's ironic because McDavid's going to have to pass the torch on to this little guy. Well, not right away, though. Definitely not right, or, right away, but I could see it. Well, yeah, I mean, eventually, but I mean, look at McDavid's first three years in the league. It was really still about Crosby and Ovechkin. Yeah, that's because they were still playing at a pretty high level. We don't talk about Ovechkin now blowing the doors off of everything other than the fact that he's closing in on Gretzky's record. So that's why that comes up all the time. People don't talk about Crosby almost at all. And statistically speaking, he's still performing. Uh, he hasn't gone anywhere, but nobody talks about him. So, yeah, I mean, it took a little while, even though McDavid was viewed as, you know, the second coming. Maybe they didn't give him as much respect as he deserved the first couple of years, but he certainly gets it now. And I've watched a lot of film, film, like I'm in, a, in somewhere watching film. I've watched a lot of video and stuff of Bedard. And plus with watching him in the tournament, this dude, he's something else. He really is. I mean, it's one thing to jump on the hype wagon and say that without actually seeing him play. But watch anything of him out there on the ice. And it's just unreal. I hope that can translate into the NHL. I don't want him to be a bust. I want him to be something. I think when you have a player that plays that many steps above his peers like an Eric Lindros or like a Steven Stamkos. I don't want to say it's a no-brainer, but, you know, the thing, though, is that drafting was so much harder 30, 40 years ago than it is today. The players are better today. Everybody's better today. But the scouting's better today as well. And things are more accessible. You look at, say, like, okay, Brian Lawton, who was picked first overall in, what was it, 1983? And he was, like, awesome he was an awesome u.s high school hockey player okay 
And he got picked ahead of Steve Eiserman and Pat LaFontaine and many other guys. That was the 83 was a very deep draft, very good, solid draft year. And but how many scouts had film of Lawton's games, like all his games? Maybe they went to some of the games, maybe one or two were televised. But now it's like you can watch every player do everything. You know, everything is televised. You have freaking combines that if they're not televised, there's going to be video footage of it. Every tournament is televised in some way, even if it's just streamed online. So there's like an endless amount of footage of these players now. So I would think it'd be a little bit harder to make a mistake on somebody who's going to go first overall. I agree with you. I guess the bus are a little more rare now than they were back then. I saw the statistic when they put this up. The only players with back-to-back 100-point seasons prior to turning age 18, other than Connor Bedard, not Connor McDavid, Johnny T, Sid, Benny LeCavalier, and Mike Bossy. Wow. You ever heard of any of those guys? Oh, all of them. Yeah, so... Those are the only players that were under 18 that had back-to-back 100-point seasons in the CHL. McDavid almost did it, but he fell short. And every one of those guys is essentially a Hall of Fame career. I mean, Vinny's not in there, but could he be argued as being a Hall of Fame player? Maybe. Yeah, we could do a whole show on who should be in the Hall. So, switching gears to hockey pop culture related stuff which we don't really talk about a lot because i mean there's not a lot of hockey movies or tv shows out there i mean there's some but last week it was announced that the mighty ducks game changers tv series that streams on disney plus is going to be canceled so there was season one there was season two but there will be no season three so there's couple reasons rumored for this one is that disney's cutting 5.5 billion from its budget they laid off 7,000 staff members so they're looking to cut shows that are not getting the ratings that they like so you know of course they're gonna continue to do the mandalorian and they'll do other star wars stuff because that's going to get the viewership that's going to drive subscriptions but the mighty ducks game changers not really the kind of show that people would sign up for Disney Plus for. And then on top of that, you didn't have Emilio Estevez return as Gordon Bombay for season two. So it was kind of like any nostalgic ties that you had in the first season. There weren't any in the second season other than a cameo appearance by two of the original ducks from the movies appeared in like the first two minutes of the first episode of the second season. Not that you need to have the old players come back, but there was really no connection anymore. You know what I mean? So. Oh, but that's like taking all the momentum and just popping the balloon and that's it. And expecting it to float on its own. So when Estevez wasn't coming back to the Mighty Ducks, there was a rumor that it was because he didn't want to comply with their vaccine mandates or their vaccine protocols or whatever and he said nope that has nothing to do with it he said this is just downright a contract dispute so i guess he wanted more money they didn't want to pay him the money so he didn't renew for a second season so they went in a different direction so they brought on another character played by josh dumel uh named uh coach cole coach colin cole is the character that he played and he was kind of like the coach in the second season and for those of you who didn't watch the mighty ducks game changers don't really care about it whatever i'll just give you like the 10 second spiel first season the kids they play as another team called the don't bothers they end up beating the mighty ducks and then they get to reclaim the name the, the mighty ducks because the mighty ducks is the team with like all the a-hole parents who like train their kids really hard or whatnot right so the ducks is basically like the bad guy team and so when the good guy team beats them, one of the things they wagered was, well, we want to be the Mighty Ducks. And so they win that. So all the good kids who are kind of like okay hockey players, except for like their team captain, who's pretty good. And like the girl that he likes, she's also really good. And then in the second season, so they're the Mighty Ducks and they get invited to this elite hockey camp. But the elite hockey camp thinks that it's 
the Mighty Ducks that they beat that they're inviting and not this like ragtag bunch of kids who like just barely kind of scraped their way to like the championship game. They had to forfeit and then they like ended up playing the Ducks in like an exhibition match to win the Ducks name. And Dumel played this ex-NHL player who's running this hockey camp. And I liked his character. And I thought, all right, this is a cool, different direction. It makes sense. Now it's taking place in the summer. That's a good way to write off Emilio Estevez's character, right? Because it's like, okay, it's summer. And then they explain right away that the rink needs renovations. Okay, that's fine because it's an old rink, like 100 years old. So it makes sense. You wrote him off. You wrote off their home rink. You took him to this hockey camp. You introduced this new hockey coach. You introduced some new kids into the mix because they're at this hockey school or hockey camp. That's great. It just, it wasn't as good as the first series. And, you know, as an adult, some of it's kind of cringe for me to watch. I watch it because it's hockey. I was reviewing every episode of the first season. Second season rolled around. I literally did not have time to review the episodes. And then I think about three episodes, I was like, well, I'll go back and I'll I'll start reviewing them. And then like, as it went on, I'm like, well, I'll watch them all and then review them. And then like towards the end, I'm just like, I don't want to write about this show. It was okay. If it doesn't inspire you to put pen to paper, then I mean, point. It's, it's like, I get it. It's a kid's show and there's going to be some suspension of disbelief with the kid's show. Like if you can believe that like 10 kids with eight of them who've never played hockey before can somehow make their way to a state championship. Yeah, that's never happening. But, you know, the second season, it was just, it was like, like, let me give you like a, for instance, there was like one episode that just centered on this draft of the kids because they were going to start doing like tournament play. So like there were like eight different coaches. So each coach was like drafting the kids to be on their team and the whole episode was like about that it wasn't just the draft it was like all the the drama leading up to the draft and it was just eh, is this really an episode's worth of content wouldn't it have been like 10 minutes it wouldn't it have been better served by just like being 10 minutes of another episode so it was kind of a silly episode yeah i'm sorry i didn't watch it no to go back and check it out i will tell you one i'll get one right on that <laughs> No, I'll tell you one thing, though, because I know no one's going to watch the Mighty Ducks Game Changers. There was one episode that was pretty funny, and I think you'll find this funny. They had a game where 20 kids got picked at random to play against all the coaches. Because the coaches were like, all right, well, we're going to show you how tough it is to play when you get to a higher level. So they're not hitting the kids. It's not checking, but they're going to play against them. So what the Mighty Ducks do is they start making wagers with the other kids and one of the girls is like, oh, yeah, my uncle or whatever showed me DraftKings or whatever. So she understood, like, parlays and all this stuff. So they were taking bets in candy. And they're like, yeah, you could bet one candy bar that the coach's team is going to win. But if you bet that the kids' team will win and they win, then you'll win five candy bars. So everybody was taking that bet. They were taking the underdog because they wanted to trade their one candy bar for five candy bars. So there's like this shot where they just have like this mountain of candy in like one of their bedrooms and they're like, oh my God, we're going to win this candy. So the fat goalie kid starts eating the candy and one of the other kid eats, starts eating the candy and they're like eating all the candy because they think they're going to win. Well, the main coach character, he decides in the third period to change teams and play on the kids' teams, and then they end up winning. <laughs> so then they have to scramble to cover their bets. It was kind of a funny episode because it made fun of sports betting, and I could appreciate that. I don't like sports betting, so I think anything that makes fun of it is okay with me. So, all right. I will agree with that. I know I've bored you to sleep on this topic. That was the 10-second version, though, you said. Was it? I stopped counting after 10. It was 10 something. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, I guess some guy stole a bunch of cards from a card shop called the Hobby Shop in Leduc, Alberta, or Leduc. I don't know how it's pronounced because I've never been there. But he stole a bunch of cards and then the dummy tried to sell them. That was actually big news, you know, as far as like hobby news and stuff like that goes. It made national news in Canada and. I actually saw it being covered in news in the United States, too. I mean, this guy went in there, busted up the shop, stole, like, what the shop initially pegged is about $75,000 worth of cards. But I think the police 
put it at like 55,000. But one of the cards that he took was this Gretzky card that it was a pro gear booklet from the cup. So it's the booklet card and you open it up. It's got the autograph on the left side and on the right side, it's got a dual patch and it's from his Kings Jersey, but it's number 12 out of 12. So this isn't something that you see every day. In fact, I bet there isn't another one of these really floating around out there. And so this idiot went to another store close to Edmonton, tried to sell this thing. And then when the guy in there is like, wow, that's a really cool card. Why don't you tell me about it? The guy knew nothing about it, didn't know anything about the card, didn't know where he got it from, couldn't answer any simple questions about this card. If you had that, you would know everything about it. Any of us, if we had that card, we would know where we got it, how much we paid for it. Did we pull it out of a pack? What number was it? You know, something about the card. We would know because that's a crazy card. We would know what color socks we were wearing that day. Probably. I mean, you're Probably. talking a you're talking a two thousand dollar plus card just by itself. Right. So this guy stays within the same general area and tries to take it to a neighboring shop. Doesn't know anything about it. The guy's like, this is weird. This is suspicious. So he calls up the guy from the other shop and he's like, hey, did you happen to get one of these taken from you? And then he called the police. So Mm -hmm. police get involved. They find three of the cards that were stolen from that shop were sold in the city. Figured out who the guy was. Basically, last I checked, we're able to recover about 35000 worth of what was taken so far. I guess it's a good ending to a bad situation. We've seen these, and we've talked about a few of them over the last year or so. More and more hobby shots just getting broke into. You never used to hear about this, but now it's all over the place because trading cards have moved to the front and center. And so it's like, I can get how much for a Pokemon card? Well, I'm going to go rob that store over there. And that's what's been happening. So this guy ends up getting charges of breaking and entering, trafficking goods, possession of stolen property. I guess he had a firearm on him. Methamphetamines. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah, he had. Crystal meth. (laughs) Yeah, he had meth meth on him. Uh, So, yeah, this guy's done. But still, just, you know, this is just another example in a long line of break-ins and and robberies and stuff like that but at least this one sort of has a a happy ending which is you know a card shop that i used to go to that was in my old neighborhood i remember he was broken into and this would have been like maybe say 2008 2009 somewhere around there if i remember correctly and the only thing they stole was his computer because this was 2008 2009 if you're a thief, you're going to steal what you think is most valuable. And now, right. you know, the guy probably said, oh, I don't want the computer. I want that Gretzky card because I know that is something that is desirable or something that is expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because every thief is looking for their next big thing. And I'm sure they're watching and I'm sure they're paying attention. And not that I'm calling these people thieves, but, you know, the stuff that is front and center on the in front of the people that like all of that big flashy stuff, you know, like the backyard people and, you know, the, what's that? What's the guy that's on wrestling now? The one that opened the Pokemon box and it was GI Joe cards. Logan something or other. Logan Paul. Logan Paul. Logan Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, We talked about that and how fast we forgot his name. Yeah. He's on wrestling now. Or he moved on to wrestling. Yeah. Or he's, or, or you mean he's a wrestler. Yeah, he fancies himself a wrestler now. So no, he's, in the, he's in the WWE, starting a feud with Seth Rollins as we speak. But that's the kind of thing. So it's become like a Broadway show, you know, glitz and glamour and everything else. So now people that uh, want to be nefarious about everything, they see, hey, look, these cards are worth something. I'm going to hit this place up and I'm going to take the things that I know. You know, so I'm going to steal the Jordan rookies and I'm going to steal... Gretzky, and I'm going to steal LeBron, and I'm going to steal Patrick McDavid Mahomes, and, and Tom gonna, Brady. And... Yeah, and I'm going to take all that stuff. Of course, Canadian shops are going to be much more geared towards hockey, but he took a lot of a variety of stuff, and 
you know, there's even pictures of uh, the um, stolen stuff that they were able to confiscate that you can see online. You can see on the table, along with all the cards and everything, there's the uh, semi-automatic rifle and mm-hmm. some ammunition and the crystal meth and everything else. It's all laid out on the table. I mean, it looks like a nice, a nice quiet Saturday afternoon, sorting cards and cleaning your rifle and doing meth. Yeah. It's funny, though, about stealing cards like that, like that Gretzky, because like you said, it's numbered 12 out of 12. These guys log those things. I know. If you're a card shop, you log the serial. No, but these people are stupid. These people are are stupid because it's like they're going to steal it and then they're going to try to sell it to like the next card shop over. Yeah. And these guys don't talk to each other. I know, like, even like when like I go to another card shop, they'd be like, oh, did you hear so and so got broken into? Or, oh, did you hear so and so's retiring and he's selling his store? You know what I mean? It's like everybody knows everybody. As big as a thing as it is, it's a very small group. Right. And on top of that with social media, like if I owned a card shop and a card got stolen, I'd put a picture of it on Twitter and I'd say, hey, this card got stolen. It's from this set. It's serial numbered out of 12 copies. It's number 12 out of 12. Here's a photo of it. You would see that. You would retweet that. I've retweeted stuff like that all the time when people say I've had something stolen. Please keep an eye out for it. I know it like the Chicago Sports Spectaculars. And maybe even the national. I remember people passing out photocopied flyers saying, I had these cards stolen from my shop. If you see them, please let me know, right? Because if somebody's trying to sell the stolen cards at the national, at least you kind of have in your mind, hmm, somebody's trying to sell me this LeBron card. And I think I saw a picture of that on that flyer that somebody gave me. You know what I mean? So, like, I don't want to say it's easier, but like, look, 30 years ago, pre internet days, it would have been easier to fence something like that. You would just go to the next town over. Or you maybe you'd go to a card show, or you would take it to a different city or state and sell it. If you're going to do this kind of stuff in today's day and age, you got to be smarter than that. And if you know anything about cards, you can't take a super high-profile card like that, especially one that's serial numbered, and then try to dump it. I mean, if it was graded, you could at least break it out of the slab and then have you it could, raw. but still, something like that that's serial numbered and is that rare? I mean, come on. Okay, but if you steal a Jordan PSA 7, near mint. A rookie? Yeah. A Fleer rookie? Yeah. There's hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just saying, like, if I was a thief and I stole a graded card, unless it was a PSA 10 and I was never going to sell it, I'd crack that case. I mean, you could. Because then it becomes a raw card. It becomes the raw card, and it also considerably is going to drop the value, even though sevens and below, a lot of times people treat as raw. I think that's an exception on that card because I still see prices pretty high on lower numbers. But that's also a card that's not serial number. So you bust it out of the thing. You no longer have a serial number. You don't have the flip anymore. It's just a raw card. And there's hundreds of thousands of them out there in right. the world. But the, the grading slab has a number on it. Yeah. So yeah. if you get rid of that and it's just a raw card, then sure. Tons of people have those. Right. So here's a lesson, kids. This is what we're giving you. If you're going to steal... Don't steal serial numbered cards. And if they're graded cards, you break them out of that slab. Yeah. Don't be an idiot. Just, like, just don't. Like jailbreaking an iPhone. We could call it jailbreaking your PSA 9 Gretzky's or whatever. Yeah, I just can't believe the guy was dumb enough to not only try to get rid of it that quickly and turn it, but instead of keeping a low profile on it, but to take it to another shop. I think they said it was like less than 40 kilometers away from where that was. So it's basically in the same greater Edmonton area. It's just nuts. Guy's nuts. All right. Let's talk about some of the upcoming releases just to give a quick rundown of some of the stuff that's coming out on February 23rd. We finally get 2021 The Cup, which we talked about at length last episode. 224. We have 2021-22 Skybox Metal Universe retail boxes. 
Um, they've actually already been at Target. I picked up three boxes at Target.com about, I think I got them delivered about seven days ago. I just haven't gotten around to opening them yet. And then actually earlier today, I found Skybox Metal Universe blasters at Target and I bought more. Even though I didn't open the first three, I bought more because you need a lot to build the set. You know, something I've noticed about retail boxes and the release dates, the release dates that they throw out there, they almost seem like they're the release dates for the other people that are selling retail, not the big boxes. No. The big boxes seem to get them a week, two weeks ahead of time. And then all of a sudden, then everybody else gets them. So all the hobby shops and stuff that now sell retail or mm -hmm. the online dealers, that's usually when they get them is on those sell dates, which I find to be weird. But whatever it is what uh, it is. Okay, then in February, March, we're going to get 2023 Leaf Bang Hockey, which is a repack or buyback product. I don't know Leaf much. Leaf Bang. About Leaf Bang. Yes, they have Bang products for their other sports, too. This mm. is the first hockey one. But now the big deal is on March 1st, we get 22-23 OPG. I know you can finally sigh. I see you sighing that sigh of relief. The thing that people have been bothered by is the fact that it's been on the schedule for a while, and it's been bumped three months, multiple times. It was moved. It was going to be December, and then January, and then February, and now here we got March 1st. But this one... The March 1st date seems to be carried across the board on most retailers. And I also noticed that Upper Deck posted that on their Facebook page as well, that it's the first. So, and we have had the checklist for about a week now. So I think it's pretty safe to say that if it's not on the first, it'll be shortly thereafter. Let me ask you a question. Have you had a chance to look at the checklist yet? I did. Now, are the rookies just mainly leftover rookies from the previous year, or did they update the rookie checklist with some of the guys who made their debut in the fall? I think it's kind of a, kind of a mix. Okay. Um, because the rookies that are on the checklist are pretty extensive. I think 541 through 600. Oh. Are all the rookies you've got on the list? You've got Matt Boldy on there. Mm -hmm. So, already been around. Yeah. Um, you have Shane Wright on there. Okay. You have Slavkovsky in the list. Mm -hmm. um, you've got other guys like Jake Sanderson's on there, um, Jack Quinn, Lucas Reichel, Marco Rossi, Matty Beneers is in there. Yeah. So, I think it's kind of a mix. Noah Cates is in there. Uh, Matias Maselli's in there. So, like, all the guys that you would expect to find, I think, are pretty well covered. Owen Power. Okay, Kent, yeah. Kent Johnson's in there. You know, all the names that you want to see. Uh, I think we're getting our first Arbor, I always butcher his last name, Czech guy from the Canadians that everybody loves because he's a brute. Yeah, it's a decent rookie checklist. I mean, obviously, OPG rookies don't hold their value like – a young gun does or or something like that but it's still kind of cool i'm not a huge fan of the additional parallel cards uh there's blue red and yellow now as far as uh, parallel colors uh there's also neon pink and then there's rainbow there's like the regular rainbow there's black rainbow and there's green and gold there's a bunch. I mean, not as many as some other brands and some other releases. But again, I go after the base set, try to build the base set. So once again, I'll have to find four or five boxes of this, hopefully at a decent price. On March 8th, we've got 2021-22 Allure. And then we also have 2020-21 SP Signature Legends. This is the set that I bring up all the time that... Where is this set? They announced it two years ago. Why isn't this set come out? Why did we get a sell sheet and then never hear about this set ever again? And now it's finally on almost everybody's list as coming out and being available. And it's on pre-sell sheets now with prices. So they must know that it's actually going to be released because it's on everybody's list right now for about 200 bucks for a box. And 
you have to remember this one. This is the set that we talked about way back when, where it's going to have 350 cards, and they're going to have the regular cards and the gold foil cards, and it's the entire checklist is made up of retired and Hall of Famers. I'm pretty sure we talked about this on the show. Oh, yeah, we have, and this sounds a lot like uh, Parker's Champions. Yeah, and that's what we were kind of comparing it to. Mm -hmm. There's a profile set, there's... They called them the Decagons, which were the, you know, the little globe ball. I think mm-hmm. the cell sheet picture had a Bobby Hall as that card. And there's going to have a whole bunch of different hits. There's going to be dual signatures, triple signatures, quad signatures, a whole bunch of variety for what you're able to pull out of there. They're even throwing back to the Century Legend signature set and doing like a throwback. If you recall those cards, those were the awesome Legend signature cards that had the color player photo up top and then the gray across the bottom mm-hmm. gray stripe with the little player head and the name mm-hmm. they were they were autographed so that's like their their retro that's supposed to be included with it but this this has been out forever and we haven't heard a peep about it so now apparently it's going to come out and originally they said it was going to be on epac so one can only hope because 18 packs in a box five cards a pack Plus, you get two autos in a box for 200 bucks. Is that too much? I don't know. In today's day and age with card prices the way they are, I think that's not that bad, actually. I, uh, yeah, but I mean, okay. Parker's Champions, if I remember correctly, was about 100 a box. I know this was like 10 years ago. It was like 100 a box. And you got three autos per box, if I remember correctly. And I feel like you got more cards, but I know we talked about inflation and this and that and and everything is more now. But like I look at this and I go two autographs and they were like legend autographs, which I don't mean to demean that. But like it's going to be guys who are retired and want to sign versus, say, like Sidney Crosby, who you don't get his autograph very often and stuff or Ovechkin or McDavid. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm yeah, but for every one of those guys that you could possibly pull, how many Neil Pionk autographs are you going to get? Or how many Damon yeah. Severson autographs are you going to pull? Or When I was buying Parker's Champions, and I think I bought three boxes that year, I got like two Ron Sutter autographs, which is sad. I mean, I guess that's the thing. Like, you could be like, oh, it'd be really cool to get like, well, of course, like Gretzky, Lemieux. Wah, those kinds of guys, of course, you know, maybe think of like newer guys from like the 80s and 90s, you know. But most of the guys that you're going to pull out of a retired or a Hall of Fame type set, within our wheelhouse of what we collect, these are going to be guys that like we grew up watching and we liked. Yeah, that's you know? true. That's mostly what you're going to see in here. These aren't third and fourth line guys from today that nobody cares about and nobody's ever going to care about other than maybe a fan of that specific team or the player's mother you know right (laughs) I, i mean nothing wrong with any of the sutters i think those are cool i mean i think i pulled two rick vibes i thought that was cool same card yeah same card Wow. i think i i pulled two uh johnny busick's so i mean that's a cool card outside of boston and the occasional person that actually recognizes that name nobody knows who that is right right well so i'd much rather pull two johnny busick's or rick vibes than ron sutter's sure but if ron sutter's the worst i'd rather have a ron sutter than yakov trenin so that's just me but i've been excited for this product i'm glad it's finally going to see the light of day hey and you know what neil poink has a fun name to say It sounds like it should be one of those automatopoeia words that you'd see in an old Batman TV show, right? Like when a guy gets punched and he goes, poink, on the screen. Like pionk is the sound of being hit? Yeah. Pionk, poink, whatever. Okay, moving on. 2122 SPX scheduled to come out March 22nd. Also the 2023 Rookies box set, which I will buy. And then be like, why did I buy this? Because it's 25 cards, not 50 cards, not every rookie. Just here's 25 cards for $25. Might be $30. I forget. The price is crept up every year. 
I like it, though. I like the Rookies box set, but I liked it more when it was the Rookie class set that had, like, 50 cards or 60 cards or whatever. It was a little more inclusive. Um, My favorite is when people go to the store and they post on social media pictures of this. Is this any good? Should I buy this? Is this a good rip? Be like, yes, buy it all. Buy them all. Buy every single one. Yeah. Is this a good rip? I don't know. What are you ripping? The cellophane off the box? Because there's no packs inside. Right. Well, there's one pack of 25 cards. Yes, it's 25 cards just stuck in a box. (laughs) Uh, And then at the end of March, we'll have Upper Deck Series 2, which is awesome because I love Upper Deck. Love Series 1, Series 2, Extended Series. Oh, and then I just got to mention real quick that April 15th, we'll have National Hockey Card Day. True. Yeah, it'll be nice to have Series 2 out prior to that. That way there's a new base product for people to be driven into the hobby shops so they can participate in Hockey Card Day. I think that's why they made it a little later, because when they were doing it earlier, there wasn't really anything for people to buy to get that bonus card. That's what sucks is, you know, if you have a local card shop that actually supplies hockey, and that's few and far between down in the States here, you know, we run into issues where, Unless it's a brand new product or something super hot, a lot of LCSs don't carry that much in hockey. Unless you have a really big dealer that's out there. I have the benefit of having baseball card exchange not too far from me. Do I ever go in there? No. But I have another local card shop that's much smaller. And if I tell him, hey, can you get this or do you have this or whatever, he'll get it or try to get it if he can get some allocation for it. Mm -hmm. That's the key, though. But having something like Series 2 drop in a couple weeks beforehand, I think that's really good. I mean, really, if the only thing that was available was Opeachy from the beginning of the month and maybe a couple leftover cup tins and some Allure, I don't think that's going to drive the people in. You need something mid-range that's going to offer some incentive with the young guns and everything else that you can come in and pick up and break and participate in all the fun stuff that will be going on. Yeah. You know, when I talked with some of the dealers, especially up in Canada where national hockey card day is a bigger deal, they talked about how they would buy many boxes of the, the giveaway packs because they, they have to pay for the giveaway packs. But then as an incentive, they'd be like, well, okay, everybody who, you know, asks for a pack, it's a pack for free because that's what they're supposed to do. But then they would do something like, well, if you buy a sealed box, then we'll give you like another five packs or something. They would do things where they would just say like, they would give away so many packs. Like they'd be like, oh, okay, you're buying, a, you're you're not just buying a single pack, you're buying a box. So we'll, you know, give you the bonus card and we'll give you packs on top of that. And one dealer, and I forgot who it was, because I think this was for 2018 or 2019, they were just telling me like, they're like, we probably gave away close to a thousand packs because they were just like anything you bought, they'd figure out a, a reason to give you more packs. And they said, so they, they made a lot of sales, but then people walked away happy because they bought cards that they wanted. And then they got like tons of packs. And, you know, that's nice if you don't want to drive to five different stores to get a pack at every store. Because the first time they did that in the United States, I remember going to five different shops, getting one pack from each shop. Not getting, um, oh God, who is the guy? Not UC Soros, the guy that be replaced. Pecorine. Pecorine, thank you. Pecorine, I could not get a Pecorine card. The first year they did National Hockey Card Day USA, they had problems with the sequencing. And I remember not getting any of his cards between the packs that I got, between the packs that my girlfriend got. We each had like sets minus Pecorine. So... It was annoying. But most years we're able to build usually able to build four or five sets between everything that we're able to get from the from the shops that we go to. And uh that's always cool. And there's plenty of like social media groups and stuff like that that trade cards through National Hockey Card Day, which is kind of cool because that way if you you're missing some here and there, you can find a trade partner. Or if you want to swap USA for Canada sets, that's something that gets done an awful lot so now i'm going to interrupt you like eddie olchek and say stop it right here because i was actually going to bring that up this year there's going to be no difference between the cards that are given out in the united states and the cards that are given out in canada oh yes same 
15 cards, bonus card. Actually, I'm not sure if it's 15 cards. What I've read so far, I've actually been on Upper Decks PR about like, hey, can you get me a checklist? Can you get me some preview images? And I haven't gotten anything from them yet. But I so I don't I don't know who's on the checklist, but this season they are going to do the same identical cards in both countries. I heard they're also making these available in some other European countries that weren't before, too. What do you think about that? Same cards in both USA and Canada? I mean, it's definitely easier for them to produce. That's for sure. <laughs> they won't have to do two separate printings. True. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with it. You know, it added that extra dimension of being able to chase both sets. Um, which I liked. I liked. Which, and, was, and which I- was okay. But to some people that didn't really get into that, getting a Canadian set in the U.S. was not that easy. Occasionally, if you went to a card show or something, one would turn up here and there, as long as Sal was there selling one. But other than that, you would really never saw them. It's one of those things. I think it's more a uh, logistics thing. It's just easier for them to just do one set, one printing, do them in 10 times the volume as they normally would, and off they go. True. So. Well, they're trying something different. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's kind of sad, though, because I, I did like trading... I would trade a full set of U.S. cards for a full set of Canadian cards, and that was fun. I was thinking it'd be easier for them to track the other stuff that's in there, the insert stuff, you know, as far as like the Victory Black and the the mascot cards that are back again. Oh, that's a great point, yeah. But then again, I guess if you had two different printings of stuff, you should be able to track it anyway, but they never tell you how many of those there are. Everybody always speculates how many Victory Black cards there are. They're not serial numbered or anything. I remember when they first put those in to National Hockey Card Day packs, the rumor was, there's only 10 of these. And then I was like, nope, can't be only 10. Oh, there's only 100 of them. I'm not so no. sure if there's only 100 of them either. I think there's probably more than that. They're more rare, but I think there's definitely more than what people originally speculated. So You'll get about two Victory Black rookies per 50-pack box. Yeah of U.S. National Hockey Card Day packs. Now, in Canada, if I remember correctly, their National Hockey Card Day boxes that the dealers would get would have 100 packs. So a card shop in Canada, they'd order a box of NHCD cards. It'd be 100 packs. U.S. be 50 packs, probably because the dealers don't want to spend as much. So eh, they'll buy a 50-pack box, but not a 100-pack box, right? You know what I mean? They only want to spend a certain amount. Anyways, so yeah, got a lot of hockey cards coming up on the horizon. So any last thoughts before we wrap this one and call it a podcast? I think it's called a podcast. That what's in the title. So we're calling it? We're calling it? It's a podcast. It's called. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to like and subscribe. Please be sure to tell your friends, hey, maybe take a minute or two and write us a review on Apple iTunes podcasts, whatever they call it, or on Google Play or on Spotify or on any of the podcast providers. Take a moment, give us a rating, give us a review. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.